Okay. <clears throat> Statman here for <clears throat> chapter nine, day three in your notes. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between the uh, calculator, which I have online, and the two prompts that we have to here together. These are really thorough. So obviously stop the video anytime you want to <clears throat> write, write everything down. And remember, these are my notes. So what you might write in your notes are slightly different because I have some talking points in here and it's a little bit different, but <clears throat> let's go through it. All right. So we, we got a question. Uh, let me start the beginning here on this one. Sorry about that. So this is a really cool question. I found this data a long, long time ago on test anxiety. And I have four um, parts up here, uh, four items that I want to go through, okay? How to write up a hypothesis test. That's a four-step process, okay? And remember that process is H-O-H-A, the requirements or assumptions, the tests itself, and then the conclusion, okay? And then they could ask you on the test, what does a p-value mean? And you probably have heard it before, but I'm going to kind of treat this as if you haven't heard it at all. And then um, how to calculate the appropriate confidence interval as well. You don't do a, a p-value test and a confidence interval together. You do one or the other. We are practicing both just for practice. But if they ask you to run a test, then you're going to run a, a test. If they ask you to do an interval, you're going to do an interval, but I'm going to do both because you can still read off of both of them. And then type one and type two errors are asked sometimes. Don't answer the type one, type two error question unless it's asked, but we're going to go through everything. So this is going to be, um, this is going to be a real keeper for you, this particular uh, video, I think. Okay, so this is a cool prompt. So test anxiety is common among high school and college students. Recently, two educational psychologists, yes, there is a there is a job called educational psychologists, which is kind of interesting. Um, so theorize that various cultures react differently to anxiety. I think we kind of know that. Students around the world, because a lot of countries have really high stakes tests, the United States really doesn't. Because if things go wrong in high school, you can simply go to a junior college. It's not like it's only your only shot. So uh, other countries have tests that are really, really high stakes, and it's, it's, it almost defines their future. So there's a lot of pressure. Students around the world were asked a series of questions to attempt to measure their test anxiety level and to wear a heart monitor on test days. Pretty cool. A scale was established from 1 to 100. Now, I don't really know what that scale is. I don't know if 1 is sleeping and 100 is you're going to die. I'm not really sure what the numbers mean, but it was measured from 1 to 100. American-born children average 41. So if 50 is the halfway point in stress, they're slightly below it. They had an interesting group, non-Asian, uh, non-American-born Asian students. So, you know, kids of uh, Asian descent that were born in America. And, you know, they may carry more test anxiety than other Americans. It's possible. And, um, you know, from, I we, that's kind of a theory that a lot of people have is a lot of pressure in some cultures, families. So let's just check it out. So a sample of 25 of these kids, of these Asian board kids that were, um, they were not born in America, but they're in school in America. They had an average of 50. So that's a lot higher. That's nine points higher on average. That seems like a lot. Is there evidence that Asian students who were born in another country have a higher mean test anxiety score than American board children? Take it that Cindy is 0.5. This says one sample Z test. We're gonna, we're always gonna do a T test. So once you scratch that on your notes, we're always gonna do a T test for means. Always do a T. Okay. So when you get this question, this is a one question question on the AP test. It's one question, but it launches a four part response. It's kind of like it. It's kind of like an essay. It launches that four part response. All right. So the first thing you're going to do is write HO and HA. And you're going to ask yourself, do I have a mean here or do I have a proportion? Well, I have a mean here and a mean is going to be mu. And you're going to look for the stable number or the, the set number, which is 41. This 50 is the sample. This is from a sample of 25. So that number is not, not, not 
in your HOHA. What's in your HOHA is going to be the uh, the the reference. They call it the reference number. In this case, it's forty one. We're trying to compare the sample of twenty five that was registered at fifty to forty one. Forty one is kind of the known number. All right. So in, like in a dice, the known number is three and a half. A dice will average 3.5 on average. That's kind of the known number. Okay. So we're going to use the symbol mu. HO always starts with equals. So we're going to write equals 41. HO mu is 41. Okay. Then you're going to write out the prompt in um, words. And pretty much just take the words from the prompt and kind of regurgitate it. This is kind of like a topic sentence that you would have in English class where your first sentence is kind of your claim, okay? It's kind of like that. So obviously you could read this for yourself, but Asian students born in the country have the, have the same anxiety levels as American students. Your default position is that it's the same. HA, the alternative hypothesis, is what you're trying to prove. HA is... Um, often called, you know, like H1, H2, H1, H2. HO is often called H null and ULL. It's an, I think it's an old English word. Anyways, HA is what you're really trying to prove. And that's Asian students born in the country have a higher test anxiety level than American born students. Okay. This symbol right here is going to be one of three symbols. It's going to be equal to, I'm sorry, it's going to be, whoops, it's going to be greater than, it's going to be less than, or it's going to be not equal to. Those are your only three choices. And the one you choose is simply the one, you're going to find the keyword. That keyword is higher. You see the word higher right there, and you think, oh, okay, that is higher. So therefore, um, we are going to have, um, we are going to have um, the symbol greater than. Sorry about those. Look at my screen for something. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and then the alpha level. The alpha level is how much proof do you need, okay? The lower the alpha level, the more proof you need. And in murder trial, you want alpha very low, 0.01, so it's harder to prove. But if you prove it, there's more evidence. 0.5 is fairly easy to prove. Who's looking for something that is drops below the 5% uh, by chance kind of level. All right. So there is... Um, there is what you got for H-O-H-E. I said, I talked a lot. I'm just here. The second step is the SPIN acronym. Notice that I never put the word SPIN anywhere. That's for you to memorize it. So what makes a legitimate study is one, the S in SPIN, is that you have a representative sample. And we are going to assume that we have that. Assume that we have a representative sample of students. Okay, that's, I don't know if it is representative. I don't know where they got these people. I have no idea where they got this data. So I'm just going to assume that it's good data. Okay, well, Assuming is dangerous, I know. But what else can we do in academia with this kind of problem? Okay, the second thing, we don't want to sample more than 10% of the population. I mean, obviously, we're not going to. There's, I'm sure there's more than 250 Asian-born students in another country. No problem. Okay. So the population size is at least 10 times that. This is the 10% rule. I'm assuming these 25 kids, none of them know each other, so they're all independent. They're not all freaking out on the same physics test or something, okay? That's not happening. And then the last thing is, now this is interesting. I wrote it one way. I might do it a different way. If I Maybe I should do it a different way, where it says sample size is not large enough. So this is a really small sample size. Really, I think you should probably say, I think I would do this differently. I would say, just assume normality with the sample. Okay. That's probably better. You have to assume it's normal. I don't know if I would worry about that so much. So 25 is a it, it's all about normality, okay? If it's over 30, then the central limit theorem is going to guarantee us normality. I would write assume normality with the sample. No problem. Now, what you're going to do here is, um, let me slide this down here a little bit. Um, now, I have all this written out here, but I'm going to draw it out. What you're going to do is you're going to draw a normal curve, like just like this. We've done this a million times, okay? 
and you're going to put the raw score. HO goes here, 41, okay? 50, the test statistic goes in the tail, okay? You're going to write the standard deviation, which is 5 divided by the square root of 25, okay? You're going to write that in there, which is 1, actually. And that's your, this is your raw score. This is your T score. Obviously, the T score is going to be 9. You can tell because it's going to be 50 minus 41 divided by 9. That's a T score. And then the P value is going to be approximately 0. There's nothing. There is nothing beyond 9. We know that 3.49 is about the end of the curve in terms of a T or a Z score. So 9 is just ridiculously far out there. Okay, so this is what I would write. I would write down. Okay, you're probably going to do this work on your calculator. So let me bring that in here. Okay, we bring the calculator in, and we're going to go. Um, let's see here. We're going to go stat tests, and we're going to do a t test. Okay, no problem. And then the data, we got 41 was our H-O-H-A. X bar, the sample of 50 came in, a sample of 25 came in at 50. The standard deviation was five and the sample size was 25. Okay, we're gonna front load all that. And we're going to do greater than. Okay, so it's gonna be greater than right there. We've done this kind of work before, okay? And then we're gonna, I'm gonna do draw. I love the draw function, okay? Coming in nice and slow there. Now, so there you go. So I can recreate what you should do on your notes, okay? What you should do is you should put 41 here, 50 here, right? And then you should put the T-score of 9 right here. And then the P-value is approximately 0. If it comes out 0, put approximately 0. And the standard deviation is going to be 5 divided by the square root of 25. Okay, so there you go. Stop and obviously copy that if you need to. Okay, so what what is that what does that mean here? All right, so what, what do we have here? Okay, so what we got is a p value of zero means you're going to reject HO. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is you only have two options: reject or fail to reject. We are going to reject HO at 05. and then our little sentence frame is with a p value of forty one. There is sufficient evidence from this study that the average is greater than 41. So these students, these Asian kids born in their country, they do have more test anxiety than the typical American born kid. OK. All right. Now, there's another way to prove that uh, the anxiety for those for that subgroup of kids is higher than the American born kids. It's to do a confidence interval. Now, we've done this before. OK. Confidence intervals was chapter eight. The confidence intervals, you are going to start with the X bar right here. That's X bar. And then you're going to go in, you're going to do, we're going to do a 90% interval. Why 90%? Now there's a reason why. We chose alpha of 5%. I'm going to write that right here. We chose alpha of 5% or 0 0.05. And we did a one-sided test. A one-sided test is greater than or less than. If you have a one-sided test and alpha is 5%, you are to double it to make it two-sided. 5% doubled is 10. And then go 100 minus that to make a 90% interval. If you did a two-sided test, which was not equal to at 5%, it would be a 95% interval because it would already be two-sided, okay? So this 90% interval, if you remember, you're going to go on table B, I think, and you're going to find this number. That's 90% confident, degrees of freedom 24, okay? And then, um, and times the standard deviation. So here that is, okay? And if you recall, you can do that on your calculator very easily, we should get at least a close or approximate answer. So if you remember how to do that, um, you're going to go stat tests, and then you're going to go to uh, T interval, which in mine is number eight. Okay. And it's already laid out in there. And look, it has a 90% interval already for me. And boom, 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 hit calculate. And you should get uh, an interval between 48 and 51. So or 52. So 
the the average score for the Asian kids not born in this country should be between 48 and 52, somewhere in there, okay? So that's pretty easy. So um, and as you can see, there it is, 48 and 52. And again, I'm right here, 48 and 52, okay, right in there. And what you notice is 41 is not in the interval. So if you did it this way, you would see reject HL because the interval does not capture the mean in HL. Or you say because 41 isn't in the interval, you could say that we could conclude that that stress level is higher than 41. In fact, it's pretty much, it's at least seven points higher. That's that's a lot higher, okay? All right, so that's a complete test. Now, other things they could ask, they could ask what a meaning of a p-value is. The basic meaning of p-value is the probability of something, something happening by chance, even if HO is true, okay? So what's the probability, if you have a dice that averages three and a half, what's the probability that you roll a dice 100 times and it averages five? That would be ridiculous. You'd be getting all fours, fives, and sixes, right, to average five. Over 100 rolls, that seems incredible. That would never happen by chance. Your conclusion would be something's wrong with that die, right? That's the basic concept. So what does that p-value of zero mean that we calculated? In other words, there was no chance that you would have 25 kids have an anxiety level of 50 if it was supposed to be 41, that, that, that's really high. These kids are very stressed, okay? So a p-value of zero means that if Asian-born kids have the same, te uh, same test anxiety level as American-born students, there's a zero probability that a 725 would produce an average of 50 by chance. It's that idea that this data would never happen by chance. It's zero meaning never, okay? So that's why your conclusion is a is that they're more stressed because this is no accident that we got this data, okay? Now, in terms of type one, type two errors, a type one error is when you, if you reject HO, you run the risk of a type one error. Now, it's not likely that you committed it. Don't get me wrong. Stats works most of the time, but you do run the possibility of a type one error, when you reject HO. If you fail to reject HO, you run the risk of a type two error, okay? So we have, we may have committed a type one error, which, which is we erroneously rejected that Asian born students have the same anxiety level as American born students and concluded that Asian students born in their country have higher than the American born kids. We may have done that if, um, incorrectly. A type one error brings consequences. On the AP test, they will ask you, name a consequence. They will not say name the consequence because there's more than one. So if you think these kids are really stressed, a consequence might be you start implementing programs to calm them down. You know, maybe different policies that, that, that relieve their anxiety. Maybe we do parent nights. We may be spending energy on something when in reality, they weren't any more stressed than anybody else. That would be an example of a consequence in that area, okay? So there is a thorough look at a pretty simple question. Pretty cool, pretty cool study, okay? Now the next one is SAT scores. Now I, I wanna warn you that this data is the old SAT. For a while they were running SAT scores that were out of 2,400 for a while. They're not running them that way anymore, okay? But just FYI, that's what's going on here in this in this old question that I have. I got. I need to update this question. Okay, SAT prep courses. Do they work? Okay, a lot of kids have taken SAT prep courses, especially kids that want to go to a private school where they need a good SAT. SAT prep courses are popular from College Board Records. The overall mean score of SATs is sixteen fifty, Senate Division one sixty. A Yale professor took a random sample of 15 volunteer students. By the way, this data is completely made up, unlike the other one, completely made up. All first-time test takers and enrolled in an SAT prep course. Their results after taking the prep course and the SAT were an average score of 1680. Is there evidence that it worked? All right, so check this out. They got a little higher score, about 30 points higher, correct? Uh, over 15 kids. That's not a lot of people, but they did get a little little higher. Okay, we're looking for evidence. Again, a one question question. Really cool. A one question question. So let's give it a go. Okay. 
So the first thing we're going to do is um, we're going to write out HOHA. And in this case, HOHA is going to be uh, mu is 1650. Students taking the SAT or prep course have the same score as those who didn't. And then it works higher than 1650. Again, this goes in HOHA. This does not. This is the test statistic. Always in HOHA, it's the same number written. Okay, and we're going to set alpha as 05 again. All right, so here are our assumptions for this. Okay, we have a representative sample of students. Caution, they're volunteers. That's a good notation by me. Okay, sometimes volunteers are a little more motivated, but we're going to assume that these are representative people. But again, most people taking the SAT are pretty motivated, so that's probably okay. And of course, we have at least 150 test takers. I highly doubt there's no way we sample more than 10%. Each score is independent. They didn't cheat. Now, we've got to proceed with caution deal again. Again, I might write this differently. I think I would go a different direction here. I would say assume normal distribution, distribution of scores. That's what I would write. Assume normal distribution of scores, okay? Pause it there if you need to. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this test, all right? I'm going to put it right here. We're going to run this. I'm going to draw it out a couple times. So you should be drawing what I'm drawing here in blue. This is this is the information, but you should be drawing this out. Okay, so what goes here is 1650. What goes out here is 1680. And the standard deviation was uh, 160 over the square root of 15, okay? And if we get a T-score, that's that's done right here mathematically. This T-score wasn't quite one standard deviation, about 0.7, so that's about right here. There's your T-score. And then that area above it is actually quite large. It comes out about 24%, 0 0.2398. I would recommend you circle or box this so everybody can see that, okay? And of course, that is way, way, way above 0.05. So we're going to have a fail to reject, meaning this data did not prove that his prep course worked. Now, it might work, but this data doesn't prove it. OK, so let's go ahead and jump over to the calculator and, and do that. OK, let's jump over to the calculator. OK. So we're gonna go uh, stat, we're gonna go to tests, and we're gonna go to a t-test. Gotta memorize this data here. I believe it was 1650, and x bar was 1680. X bar was the sample of 15 kids. Standard deviation was 160. Standard deviation was 15, and greater than, we're looking for a one-sided kind of deal here. So let's go draw. They should come in there. It'll be shaded. See how it's shaded. Just make sure you shade it in. All right. So there you go again. So to dress this up, remember, you're going to draw out here the standard deviation, which was 160 over the square root of 15. Okay. And then this is going to be 1650 in the middle. This is 1680 out here. And then your T score is going to be 0.72. 0.73 basically is your T score. And then here's your P value right here on the third level. Remember, raw score, T or Z score, and percentile is how I want you to do that. Okay. So that's how you're going to draw it on your paper. And that is the, so what this says, what that P value says is that there's a 24% chance we would get data just like this, even if this prep course didn't work. In other words, even if even if the average is still 1650, you might get 15 people get this average. It would happen about 24% of the time by chance. That's really high. So it doesn't prove that uh, or demonstrate sufficiently that uh, this prep course does work. Okay. All right. So um, let me slide this out of the way. Okay, so there's that. Now the confidence interval you could easily do. Well, let me let me continue on. Sorry, let me continue on with this. So 
In this case, you're going to fail to reject HL. With the p-value of this, there is insufficient. Remember that keyword is going to be sufficient or insufficient evidence. There is insufficient evidence that, I got that key wrong here. There's insufficient evidence that the prep course works. Right? That's one way to write it. There's insufficient evidence that the prep course works. Okay? So that's what I would write. With the p-value of this, there's insufficient evidence from this study of, that the prep course works. It, it might work. You're not saying it doesn't work. You're saying there's insufficient evidence that it does work. Okay? You're not, you know, you're not denying that it could work. All right. Now, the, the p-value part, uh, p-value of 0.2398 means that if students taking the SAT prep course have the same score as those who didn't take the course, there's a, in other words, that, by the way, this sentence in that's bolded right here, this right here is really rephrasing HO. With the P at uh, 0.2398, this means that there's a probability, a 24% probability that the sample of 15 would produce them an average of 1680 by chance. You could also say there's a 24% chance that, the, that we would get this data by chance alone, even if HO is true. There's a lot of ways to say this on the p-value. There's a lot of ways to do that. And you got to be familiar with different ways to say it because they can get you on multiple choice. Okay. Now, this is a fail to reject HO. Fail to reject HO. Now, fail to reject HO means you could have a type 2 error. Let's look at that. So in this case, a type 2 error would be we may have committed one. We may, we, we, uh, erroneously failed to, re to reject, uh, failed to, ED, get rid of that, failed to reject that students taking the SAP prep course had the same score as those who didn't take the prep course. So in other words, a type two error could be, you could re-say it this way, okay? The prep course may work, but we didn't detect that. That is also a strong possibility. The prep course worked, but we didn't detect that. Okay. Now, a consequence of that would be you don't send anybody to the prep course because you don't think it works. But in reality, it does. It's a missed opportunity is another way to write. A, a type 2 error is often a missed opportunity. Not always, but often. Okay. Now, let's examine the confidence interval way to do this, which could have happened. So let me slide back up. So the confidence interval is going to take X bar first right here. And then it's going to go 90%. Um, degree 90 percent confident and this is 14 degrees of freedom and then there's your standard deviation and this will give us where we think the scores would be on average if you took the prep course okay so let's go ahead and bring the calculator back in and go ahead and do that all right we'll go stat tests and uh, t interval number eight Okay, and that one's going to be, um, what is this going to be? This is going to be, yeah, I think I got it all right there. It's all written down perfectly. All right, good. Hit calculate, and boom, there it is. So if you're looking at this, the confidence interval says that we think the scores are going to be between 1607 and 1752. The key here is at 1660 or 1650. 16 her 1650 is still in the interval. You need the entire interval to be above that to have evidence that your prep course works. You don't have that. 1650 remains a possible answer to the question of what's the average score if you took the prep course. Okay? So let me remove this. So there we go. All right. So that is um, ch chapter nine, day three, a good one. That might be something you go back and look at. Okay. Good luck.